What is your name and age? My name is Prachi and I'm 20 years old. I'm Prabhat, my age is 33. I'm Makeda, I'm 22 years old. My name is Lawrence. Ali and I'm 18 years old. And my name is Andrew Burry, I'm 18. My name is uh, Matthew Jones and I'm 26 years old. I'm Theo and um, I'm 19. <laughs> You're like, I'm thinking about that. <laughs> so me and Steph have been living together for the past six years, and I don't think it's ever occurred to either of us that there's such polarizing views on the topic or the conversation of whether you should move in with your significant other. Also, I, this isn't really a video about whether it's right or wrong to, even though I'm sure you guys are going to let us know in the comments and we want you to let us know. But we did want to see what people know and what they don't know. That's the main purpose. So today we're going to ideally have a conversation around whether you should move in, you, fictitious you should move in with your significant other. First big question for you, would you move in with your significant other? Would you move in with your significant other? Would you move in with a significant other? Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah, I would say yeah, so. Yeah, sure. Have you heard of a common law relationship yes. before? That is when you're staying with somebody for an extended period of time they're, they're, they're in a relationship with, but have not gotten engaged or married yet. Yeah. Now that you mention it, I guess so. Like, if there's a benefit to filing taxes together, sure. ah, I'm all policy. for saving a buck here and I there. Like, I know? like that like, perspective on yeah. it. What about a cohabitation agreement? Have you ever heard of that or signed a cohabitation no, agreement before? No, no, no. Yeah. Okay, so moving in with your significant others, so your girlfriend, your boyfriend, or your partner, or whoever they are, we feel is one of those things where you either, you, you either do a lot of research and you feel like you know what you're doing, or it's one of those things where you don't do enough research. And I feel like from the stories that me and Steph have come across, both in our personal lives with friends and even online, it kind of proves out that theory. Now, even though it's an important decision, the outcome's gonna be different for everyone and for a variety of reasons, right? For some people, whether that's culturally or traditionally, it's just not happening before marriage no matter what. Yeah. Other people choose to wait until marriage until they're fully committed. That's yeah. the sign for them until they do it. So it's gonna be different depending on your reasoning. Anyways, regardless of what's been the norm in the past, the common trend, at least for the past few decades, has seen a lot more couples actually opting to move in together. Now, Pew Research does this study where they ask a whole bunch of different age groups questions on marriage versus people who are unmarried. And what they found is that there was a really high public support for people saying that they're in support of people who are living together and aren't married. Now, what's also interesting is that those numbers of people showing support have actually doubled since 1993 when they did a similar study. Now, the other thing that was really interesting to us was when we did our own little study and did some of those street interviews, a big thing that kept popping up was money. Now, of course, when you live in big expensive cities like we do in Toronto, it's always a topic of conversation because it's so expensive, mm -hmm. but it also comes together when it comes to living together. People sometimes use that as a reason to justify moving in together more quickly, where like rent's gonna be 2,000 plus dollars a month, who can really afford that on their own? Obviously, let's split the rent and do it that way. We obviously relate to this too. Yeah. If you guys know our story at all, we've been living together for the past five years. Mm -hmm. And one of the big catalysts for that, we'd only been dating for like a year when we moved in together. We moved from a smaller city to Toronto and we're like, exactly that. Starting out salaries after yeah. graduating university, it's expensive, let's split the rent. Oh, okay, okay, okay. By the way, we also see this happening on the marriage side as well, where mm -hmm. people are also choosing to postpone their marriages because either one of the partners isn't financially sta stable or isn't in a place where they feel like they should be financially. Yeah, and a lot yeah. of the times you don't have to be in like this big financial place to get married, but I think it's more like the traditional symbol to people mm -hmm. that a wedding, even just buying the ring, these are expensive things that yeah. involve spending money. So people are pushing that off a little more because they don't feel like they're in the position to do it. Yeah. So I know that we showed you guys a few snippets of our woman on the street clips already, but a few key things that we discussed were cohabitation agreements and common law relationships. And those two things are also a big reason why we want to talk about this topic, both with people on the street, but also doing this video mm -hmm. too, is because there's some of the big pieces to the money side of living together that can actually help protect you. But literally a lot of people, as we saw from talking to people, don't know a lot about them or how they work. So yeah, a common law relationship is defined when a couple lives together, but they're unmarried and they've lived together for a certain period of time. Or they live together, once again, are unmarried, <laughs> and they have a kid or they share a child together. Now, on the flip side, if we're looking at the US, the US actually doesn't recognize common law relationships. They do, however, have uh, common law marriages yeah. in a select number of states. And you can you can look up what that what that means. We're not gonna really dive into it today because it is just this rabbit hole of like a whole bunch of stuff. And once again, it only applies to a select number of states. But in a second, we're gonna throw up Lawrence, who we got to speak to, or Steph got to speak to, and he kind of shared with us his story because he's both a Canadian citizen and a US citizen. Now, a common law relationship, at least on the Canadian side, is something that technically just happens once you hit that number of months or years that you've been living together. A cohabitation agreement on the other side is something that you actually have to actively choose 
choose to do. Mm -hmm. So a cohabitation agreement, it's a contract that establishes the different rights and responsibilities of, again, an unmarried couple who are choosing to live together. Now, like you said before, you have to actually like enter into and make this contract for yourselves. It could do a few different things. It could in general just be for like the day to day, who's going to pay for what, what bills, bills when you live together and actually have that in writing. Yeah. But a really common use case for it that's also really important is when two unmarried people who are dating buy a property together, which is actually pretty common. You guys have heard us talk about yeah. wanting to do that before. We haven't done it yet, but it's on the list. And it's a pretty common thing to happen as well. And what it's useful for in that case is, again, you could still outline who's going to pay for what or just in general how the bill situation is getting paid for. But it could also be if you end your relationship, if you break up, who's going to actually own that asset? What's going to happen to the home in the case of you guys breaking up? Yeah. Now, the reason that this is important is because if you're married, there's already some sort of legal contract in place that somehow covers the home. Not necessarily always good. We've seen things yeah. about people who don't have their name on the home when they're married and they don't yeah. know it. It's actually a really unfortunate thing. So they've been married thing. for like 20, 30 years and all of a sudden like everything's gone. You know? Yeah, it's in one person's name and yeah. if you aren't on good terms when you end the relationship, which is actually a big reason why you should do these contracts when you are in a good space, when you Absolutely. have each Absolutely. other's interests and heart, you care about each other and you write this down. Again, when you're unmarried, it's Actually, it's not even more important. They're both important. But the reason that it's important is because there's nothing outlining what should happen otherwise. And it can be really messy, really expensive. You're already living somewhere that's expensive. Who can afford that? Who can deal with the stress of that? So a cohabitation is, agreement is something that can be really helpful for people. For sure. Now cue the clip of <laughs> uh, women on the street. Yeah. <laughs> cue the tapes. Would you move in with a significant other? Secondary question to that, would money be a factor in that at all? I feel like, in, like you know, today's economy for sure, you know, money definitely is a factor because you want to live comfortably, right? You don't want to be yeah. like, struggling to make ends meet. So I feel like for sure that would be a factor in moving, moving in with your SO. Yeah, so expensive here in Toronto, you think that might motivate you to move in with someone faster in theory? Probably. Yeah, I would say yeah, so, yeah, for yeah. sure. Would you move in with a significant other? Would I? You know, I'm privileged, so uh. my significant other I mean, whatever, we both have kids, divorced, you know, okay. that whole thing. So she has her house and I have yep. my house. Ah. Well, it's an interesting perspective, actually, because we were asking people their thoughts on would money impact your like likelihood to move in together? Would that be a factor? Well, Especially of course, it has to be. Living, yeah. Oh, my God, I, the cost of living is yeah. just, like, outrageous. So, yep. you know. I would move in with someone. Uh, I feel like I would consider finances before anything mm -hmm. else. Yep. I think I wouldn't want to get into a situation where I'm responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. I would want it to be, you know, 50-50, whether that's... Yep. financial or like you know I pay for more but you do more housework like I feel like there has to be some kind of compromise yeah yeah and then what's your ideal scenario if you're with someone and you're living together how would your money situation be how would you split things up what would you look for I would say I would like you know rent for sure split it down the middle yep. and uh, also with with utilities as well yeah um, food, like just pretty much everything, you know, yeah. make it equal 50 50. Okay, I like that. Have you heard of common law relationships before? Well, that's what I have. Yes, okay, yes. there okay. we go. Okay. Your thoughts on common law relationships, high level. I would love to know your thoughts on them because, well, I mean, for me, it, yeah. it's great. I'll tell you why. Here's the rub of it. I, yeah. I mean, I'll confess on camera. <laughs> I'm a U.S. citizen, okay. okay? I'm cool. also a Canadian citizen. Yep. Now, if you don't know the rules about U.S. citizenry, yeah. like my motto is once a member of the empire, always a member of the <laughs> empire. So I have to file yeah. U.S. taxes, ah, so you file okay? Both. So that means technically I have to pay U.S. taxes. Yeah. They give me a dollar for dollar credit. So, so, we pay, so, so since you pay more taxes literally in Canada, I yep. never owe them anything. But if I were to sell my house, then yeah. that's another issue. Interesting. But the thing is this, if we were literally married, if she sold her house, well, that would be our asset. Assets, yes. She would have to pay taxes. Like, ah. Oh my God. Have you heard of a common law relationship before? So from a tax perspective, it's actually only 12 months even. So you could be, months. yeah, you could be living with someone that's not even necessarily that long term of a relationship, but you'd be tied together from a tax perspective. Do you, would that impact your thoughts on moving in with someone either negatively, positively? Do you not care too much? It's just good to be aware of it. So what are the impacts on the tax then for that? Well, from a tax perspective, they in theory want you to file your taxes together when you've been living together, together with someone for over 12 months. I and see. this is something a lot of people don't think about, right? Because then you're pretty tied to someone. It doesn't mean you can't split up and stop living together, but would that impact your thoughts on living and moving in with someone? I'm like, if we're both like financially responsible, yeah. uh, then I feel like it wouldn't be that much of an issue. Yeah. On that note, do you talk um, about money with someone that you're in a relationship? Would you? Is that something you're open with? I feel like as adults, that it's something that you have to get used to, you know? It's just, yeah. it's part of life, and for sure, like, you, you want to you have everything in the open yep. with your SO. Yep. Yeah, awesome. U.S. does not recognize common law relationship. Mm. So the Canadian tax forms, you can yeah. check off common law, but on the U.S. tax form, single? there's no such thing. I have to, I mean, I can't say married, yep. that's not true. They just go single. So I press single, and yeah. so that way, that's my way around that kind of 
companion yeah. ass, basically. So if anything, it's almost a beneficial to stay in the common law side of things. Well, for us, yeah. yes, absolutely. From a financial perspective, From a yeah. financial, you know, yes, for yeah. us, it's that way. Yeah, uh-huh. very interesting. Uh-huh. Now, what's interesting and what I think we actually haven't covered yet, Steph, is mm-hmm. the fact that there's probably a lot of people who are thinking, great, like I have this information, but you've either ruined my life by, <laughs> you know, making it seem like my partner is potentially just going to like screw me over in the future and I need to be thinking about these things saying from that. Is bliss. <laughs> yeah, well, th- that might be the case, right? Or there's the other side where it's like, okay, now I have this information, but, you know, the romance is dead. I don't know, like the romance, yeah, exactly. The romance <laughs> and everything is gone, right? Yeah. How do I deal with that? Well, I feel like from the perspective that we're coming at it from, it's it's, it's from the perspective of we're giving you the information that you know it's out there, right? Yeah. Like we've had a lot of people ask us these type of questions where they're like, listen, I grew up in um, like a uh, you know yeah. divorce or like a two, two separate parent household. Yeah. And I just want to make sure that I'm good to go. And I protected. want to make sure that I'm protected. Like, yeah. Well, a lot of people, you don't know what you don't know. And you also aren't prepared for things that you have no idea could be coming, right? Exactly. So there's the positives to coming from a situation yeah. like that where you know to protect yourselves. There's also negatives, right? Because it makes you feel maybe sure. more skeptical about things. But it's important to have the information. Now you have it. Do with it what you want. Use this, as we do with all our videos, as a starting point to do more research. Exactly. And make sure you ask us for questions about this down below. Because obviously, we're in a common law relationship. So we can ask, answer yeah. a little bit. And if you haven't checked out any of our previous videos, make sure you do check them out next door. And yeah, let's go.